In 1845, the German chemist Christian Friedrich Schonbein was experimenting with mixtures of nitric and sulfuric acids when he spilled a mixture of these two acids on the table. He grabbed his wife's cotton apron to mop it up, but when he hung the apron on a nearby stove to dry, it exploded. This was the first step towards the discovery of gun cotton, which we know today as nitrocellulose. And nitrocellulose is used in everything from explosives to x-rays to early silent films and nail polish. But nitrocellulose begins its life as the humble plant molecule cellulose. And cellulose makes up so much more in our lives than just paper. It's what makes our houses strong, it's in our food, clothing, plastics, it is everywhere. In fact, it's one of the most abundant organic molecules on the planet. So how does this tiny molecule hold up so much of our modern world? Some of the tallest trees in the world are in California's Redwood National Park. Coastal redwoods can reach over 300 feet tall. The world's tallest tree, Hyperion, towers over even the other giants at 379 feet. But like any tree, they start as tiny saplings. So how do these tiny plants grow into massive organisms? And how does the cellulose molecule keep them standing tall for hundreds or even thousands of years? Cellulose is the main chemical building block of plant cell walls, and it's what makes them strong. It's also one of the most abundant naturally occurring compounds in the world. Wood is about 50% cellulose when dry, while cotton is closer to 90%. But cellulose starts off, like a lot of things, as small building blocks. In this case, carbon dioxide and water. A tiny sapling tree is going to get much of its mass from these two molecules. Plants take in both of these molecules and turn them into glucose using photosynthesis. A glucose molecule looks like a ring and is one of the simplest sugar molecules. Plants then take these glucose molecules and use them as building blocks to make long strands, creating polymers. Two types of polymers are formed. One is starch, which stores energy, and the other is cellulose, which helps create structure in the plant, much like a skeleton in humans and other animals. Each strand of cellulose is made up of hundreds to thousands of glucose molecules, all strung together in a long chain. This makes it a polymer, a molecule made up of lots of repeating units, or monomers. Here, the monomers are the glucose molecules. And if you want a tall tree, you're gonna need a lot of cellulose. While it's made up of thousands of glucose molecules, it's still small when we think about things we can see. A long strand of cellulose could be about 0.04 millimeters long. If you stood it up next to a fine grain of sand, it would only reach a quarter of the way up. And when you consider that the tallest trees in the world can be about 300 feet tall, which is about 100 meters or 100,000 millimeters, well, you're gonna need a lot of CO2 and H2O to create all of that cellulose. And honestly, that's great for our planet. Forests and other plant life around the world soak up about 25% of human carbon emissions. Cellulose is really tough. It's what lets plants stand up straight and not flop over, reaching those crazy heights. We humans have learned to use this toughness and strength to our advantage in lots of different ways, from building to wearing. Though cellulose molecules all start off pretty much the same, they could end up in lots of different places from paper to clothing to the food you eat, or even explosives. So let's take a look at some of the many paths cellulose molecules could take. Probably the most straightforward path for a cellulose molecule from a tree, a plant, or a blade of grass is to be eaten as food. While our human stomachs can't break it down, many animals like cows, sheep, and horses have evolved methods of breaking it down that involve long, slow digestive processes, lots and lots of chewing, and a whole host of symbiotic gut bacteria that we don't have. But that doesn't mean we humans don't snack on a bit of it every now and then. Of course, you expect cellulose to be in things like vegetables, especially tough ones like leafy greens. But we also add it to other stuff like shredded cheese and barbecue sauce. And the cellulose we're adding is usually from wood, like tree wood. So should you be worried about sawdust in your pizza cheese? Well, no. Cellulose is just one of many molecules present, and it's great as an anti-caking ingredient which prevents shredded cheese from clumping together. And while we could get it from other things, like onions and asparagus and other foods that we eat, that would kind of be a waste of those perfectly good foods. Making it from wood is also pretty cheap, and even though we can't break it apart and digest it like a cow, it still acts as fiber that helps keep our digestive system running smoothly. Have you ever looked up at a tall tree and said to yourself, 
Hey, that make a lot of paper. Well, you'd mostly be right. You might remember making paper in art class, you know, grinding up a bunch of used paper in a blender and then smushing it together. And I used to think that that's how all paper was made. You know, you just grind up some wood and squish it together and bam, paper. Sorry, tall tree. But paper is actually a bit more complicated than that. In wood, the cellulose molecules are all bound together with another polymer molecule called lignin, which acts like a glue holding the cellulose together. So you have to get rid of the lignin to get to the cellulose. To do this, the wood chips are first soaked in an alkaline solution, which breaks down the lignin, helping to release the cellulose fibers. And the longer the cellulose fibers, the stronger the paper. So this process usually involves processing the wood chips by trying to beat them rather than chop them up. Once the cellulose fibers have been released from each other and washed, the mixture is then bleached to remove any remaining lignin and turn the fibers white before they're turned into paper. And the final part of this process does involve smushing them together. Large machines place a suspension of wet cellulose fibers onto a large screen where they're pressed and then dried out to create paper. But the cellulose in a tree could also become something a bit more transparent. We figured out methods to turn cellulose into things like plastic too, specifically cellophane. Cellophane is that thin plastic film that wraps everything from crackers to birthday presents. That cello is from cellulose. In the early 1900s, Jacques E. Brandenberger tried to come up with a waterproof fabric coating. Supposedly, he'd seen another customer at a restaurant spill a glass of wine on the tablecloth, and he wondered if he could create a surface that could be easily wiped clean. His first attempts involved spraying a waterproof coating on a tablecloth, but the fabric was way too stiff to use afterwards. However, he noticed that a reaction had occurred between the fabric and the coating to create a thin, clear film that could be peeled off. This was cellophane. Cellophane starts off as a pulp of ground up wood, cotton, or even hemp, and goes through a chemical process where at first it becomes something called viscose. And if that name sounds vaguely familiar, just check out your clothing labels. Viscose is actually a popular fabric that's probably hanging in your closet. Brandenburger's tablecloth started off as viscose, and even today, we take viscose and treat it with sulfuric acid and sodium sulfate to make cellophane. Similar compounds like cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate were also used for things like movie film. However, that first one, cellulose nitrate, had a wee bit of a problem. It had a tendency to decompose explosively. Uh, you might know it by another name, nitrocellulose. It easily explodes at low temperatures, even as low as 38 degrees Celsius. It's been the cause of a number of fires, including a nitrocellulose film storage facility for 20th Century Fox, and a fire at the Cleveland Clinic started in a storage room filled with nitrocellulose x-ray images. Nitrocellulose film has to be stored in cool, dry conditions because its reactivity also makes it prone to degradation, so careful storage and digital backups are important to make sure we don't lose film history. So that big tall tree, it might just explode one day. Cellulose is a key component of a number of explosives, but its discovery as a useful flammable substance was also partially accidental. Back to our friend Sean Bine and his exploding apron. The cotton apron was full of cellulose molecules. When it was exposed to the nitric and sulfuric acids, many hydrogens on the cellulose molecules were substituted with nitro groups, NO2. The resulting fluffy white gun cotton is unstable and extremely flammable, which is why it's used in explosives and rocket propellants. The key to gun cotton's explosivity is all of these nitro groups. These groups are relatively unstable, while the gases that result from their decomposition, like nitrogen, are very stable. When we talk about chemical stability, what we're really talking about is how many electrons they have. Remember from our episode on red tides, that electrons exist at set distances from the nucleus of an atom. Each of these distances is called a shell, and each shell has a specific number of electrons that it's able to contain. If it has fewer electrons, it wants to fill them by reacting with another atom, creating a bond and sharing their electrons so that both of their shells are filled. Nitrogen is an important product of gun cotton decomposition, and its stability comes from the three bonds that hold the nitrogen atoms together. When these bonds are formed, all of the nitrogen atoms' outermost shells are filled with electrons. This makes it very stable. Now, these three bonds require lots of energy to break, but also release lots of energy when they're formed. 
This decomposition of gun cotton is called exothermic because the energy is released as heat. The released gases have a much greater volume than the starting solids do. So not only are they hot, but they rapidly expand. And that combo of heat and expanding gases, that's an explosion. And the properties that make cellulose great as an intentional explosive also make it really good at being unintentionally explosive too. Let's say we cut down our cellulose filled tree. Pile of sawdust seems pretty harmless, just kind of dusty, but it's tiny wood fragments full of cellulose are highly combustible. If it gets blown up into the air, you now have a mixture of lots of combustible materials with all of the oxygen in the air, making a perfect fuel mix for an explosion. The small sawdust particles have a lot of surface area, giving the cellulose lots of opportunity to interact with oxygen. A tiny flame or spark can cause a huge disaster. But let's say that we don't turn that cellulose into paper or food or explosives. What if that tree grows and grows and then finally falls, crashing down to the forest floor? What becomes of it then? Well, it'll die and start to decompose. Organisms like fungi and bacteria will start to break down cellulose and lignin, using their energy to grow. However, because cellulose is so stable, the decomposition is very slow. Think about your favorite hiking trail and the dead tree lying on the side. Year after year, it's still there, only very slowly degraded by fungi and bacteria. And millions of years ago, the process was even slower. Though there is some scientific disagreement, some research suggests that fungi didn't develop the ability to break down lignin until about 300 million years ago. This meant that plant matter built up over time and became oil and coal after being exposed to huge amounts of pressure and heat. Cellulose and lignin-eating fungi today are one potential reason why the Earth is no longer producing these fossil fuels at the same rate it did millions of years ago. The biofuels industry continues to look for a way to chemically degrade this most abundant organic molecule on Earth to make fuels not derived from oil. Though it starts off as just a long strand of glucose, cellulose can end up in lots of different places in the world around us. Personally though, if I were a tree, I think I'd rather end up being an explosive piece of cellulose than one that just ends up as a cellophane gum wrapper.